Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is the criminal procedure code or the code of criminal procedure. Now we have seen before that the laws can be divided into two categories. Substantive laws which define offenses and prescribe their punishments or procedural laws that talk about the procedures of how things are to be done. Now as the name itself suggests criminal procedure code. So it is a code that is regulating the procedure in criminal cases. So it is a procedural law. Now this is a very vast law. It is so big that we are going to cover it in two modules, this module and the next module. So this is the first module about the criminal procedure code and this will have three lectures. Procedure in criminal cases, classification of offenses and arrest and bail. So we'll look at what the CRPC is in the procedure in criminal cases. We will look at how it classifies offenses into categories like bailable and non-bailable, cognizable and non-cognizable, compoundable and non-compoundable and so on in the next lecture. And then we will look at how are arrests done and how do people get a bail. So let us begin with procedure in criminal cases. Now when we look at the CRPC, the first CRPC in this country came up in 1861. So it says Act number 25 of 1861 passed by the Legislative Council of India. So in those days we were under the British rule. The War of Independence of 1857 had just uh, been completed and so the, uh, the Indian territories moved from the company rule to the crown rule. So in those days there was no parliament and so this law, this CRPC of 1861, it was passed by the Legislative Council of India and it received the assent of the Governor General on the 5th of September 1861. So there was no precedent in those days. An act for simplifying the procedure of the courts of criminal judicature not established by Royal Charter. So what is the objective of this act? It is to simplify the procedure of the criminal courts. So as simple objective as that, simplifying the procedure. Because in those days, in the absence of a court, things were very complicated because different courts were using different procedures. So it said that it wanted to simplify the procedure. Of which courts? The courts of criminal ju judicature not established by Royal Charter. Now these courts established by royal charters do not exist today, but in those days the courts of admiralty, court of request, mayor's court, court of governor and council, the privy council and the supreme court, they were established by the royal charters. And so they had their different procedures and the CRPC was not applicable on those courts. Now the preamble says, whereas it is expedient to simplify the procedure of the courts of criminal judicature not established by royal charter, it is enacted as follows. So it has a very small preamble and short title, this act shall be called the code of criminal procedure. So this is where the CRPC begins in 1861. Now over time, there have been a large number of changes. But more or less the structure has been maintained. Now when we talk about the CRPC, we need to look at what is a code. Why do we call it a code? So we have seen this before in the context of IPC as well, that a code is a systematic collection of laws or statutes. So it is a collection, but it has to be a systematic collection. It is the end product of codification, which is the action or process of arranging laws or rules according to a system or plan. 
सो द लॉज एंड रूल्स हैव टू बी अरेंज अकॉर्डिंग टू अ सिस्टम और अ प्लान सो इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट द लॉज एंड रूल्स आर अरेंज इन द फॉर्म ऑफ डिफरेंट चैप्टर्स एंड डिफरेंट सेक्शंस नाउ इफ यू लुक एट सर्टेन एग्जाम्पल्स ऑफ कोड वी हैव द कोड ऑफ मनु और मनु स्मृति द नेपोलियनिक कोड और द सिविल कोड ऑफ द फ्रेंच द कोड ऑफ जस्टिनियन विच इज अ पार्ट ऑफ द कोड ऑफ रोमन लॉ द आई पी सी द सी आर पी सी एंड द सी पी सी नाउ वाई डू वी परफॉर्म दिस प्रोसेस ऑफ कोडिफिकेशन वी परफॉर्म इट बिकॉज इट प्रोवाइड्स सिविल एडवांटेजेस इट मेक्स थिंग्स सिंपल एंड वी सॉ बिफोर दैट इन द केस ऑफ द सी आर पी सी इट सेज एन एक्ट फॉर सिंप्लीफाइंग द प्रोसीजर सो बिकॉज इट वॉन्टेड टू सिंप्लीफाई सो दिस कोडिफिकेशन प्रोसेस वॉज अडोप्टेड इट मेक्स थिंग्स स्टेबल इट मेक्स थिंग्स इंटेलिजिबल सो दे आर ईजी टू अंडरस्टैंड देर इज अ लॉजिकल अरेंजमेंट एंड कोहरेंस देर इज अटैनिटी एंड देर इज अ यूनिटी ऑफ द एरिया वेयर द कोड इज एप्लीकेबल नाउ If you look at the historical context, we find that the first war of independence of 1857, also known as the Indian Rebellion of 1857, had just ended, and the Government of India Act of 1858 made a provision that the company rule would be replaced by the crown rule. So now India was to be governed directly by the crown of Britain. and because they had to begin this rule so they came up with all different kinds of acts with which they were going to rule so in this context the ipc was made in 1860 just two years after this and the crpc was made in 1861 now if we look at the crpc of 1861 we find that as in the case of uh, of a codification process it divides the whole of the crpc into different chapters so chapter 1 deals with definitions chapter 2 deals with jurisdiction of criminal courts chapter 3 deals with preliminary rules then summons warrant execution of warrant arrest without warrant escape and retaking search warrant now all these chapters are arranged in the form of a certain thematic organization so if you wanted to understand what are the processes that are related to say arrest of a person so you could directly go to chapter 6 beginning with section 100 and then you could have at your fingertips all the sections that will be applicable so it simplifies things it brings it to a logical coherence now if we look at this act in detail you'll find in uh so this is the arrangement of sections so it has the short title then chapter of definitions and then now you are getting a list of all different sections that are defining different things then let us look at the chapter on arrest so when we say of arrest without warrant then police officer may arrest without warrant in certain cases section 100 vagabonds section 101 Police may interfere to prevent offences. One o two, information to be communicated. One o three, may arrest to prevent offences. One o four, injury to public property. One o five. So all the things where arrest can be made without warrant, they have been listed as per different sections. Now, if we look at the sections in more detail, here is how it begins. So we looked at. the preamble and then the short title then it starts with definitions so chapter 1 definitions says the following words and expressions in this act shall have the meanings hereby assigned to them unless there be something in the subject or context repugnant to such construction so it is giving an interpretation of what this definitions word says and the first definition is british india what is british india the words british india shall denote the territories that are or shall become vested in her majesty by the statute 21 and 22 victoria 106 entitled an act for the better government of india except the settlement of princes of wales island singapore and malacca 
So this particular act is not applicable on these three areas. And for all the other areas that have become vested in the crown, in the crown as per this statute, British India. Then it defines things like special law. The words special law shall denote a law applicable to a particular subject. Local law. The words local law shall denote a law applicable only to a particular part of British India. So it is applicable to only to a small locality. Then it talks about movable property. The words movable property shall include corporeal property of every description except land and things attached to the earth or permanently fastened to anything which is attached to the earth. So it is defining all these different words. What is What does a number mean? What is gender? What is inquired into? What is determined? What is written? What is a criminal court? And so on. Then it also defines things like the court of justice, court of session, magistrate of the district, and so on. Now, this law was one of the most important laws of the British times because it consolidated a large number of things. However, this law was amended a large number of times as well. Because as and when a lacuna was found out, as and when there were aberrations that were found out, they were corrected. Now, this law could not be used in the Indian context today because a large number of things have become completely anachronistic. For example, the CRPC of the British Times, it provided for a separate court for Indians and a separate court for people of European descent. If a person of European descent had committed a crime, he could only be tried by a European judge. Now, during our freedom struggle, we fought against these types of differences. And so our constitution does not provide for any differences based on things like your the color of your skin. So, which is why these laws had to be changed completely. But then a large number of things could be used as precedents because the courts were already quite used to using these procedures. The procedures had been established and those things that were working fine, they could be retained and those things that had become repugnant for the modern times, they could be eliminated. So this is the historical context and there were many amendments over time. There were many amendments even during the British periods. And the current CRPC is the 1973 revision that was made by our parliament. So this revision was in response to the recommendations of the 5th Law Commission's 41st report. The chairman was Mr. Sundaram. Now, this report said that the CRPC of the British Times had to be changed. So let us look at this report now. This is the report. The Law Commission of India 41st report for the Code of Criminal Procedure 1898. So before the CRPC of 1973, which is applicable today, we had the CRPC of 1898. Before that, we had the CRPC of um, 1880s. So 1861 was not directly replaced by 1898. We also had a few other CRPCs in between. Now, what does this report talk about? So it says that sometime after the Law Commission as first constituted had submitted its report on the reform of judicial administration, the commission was reconstituted and it was asked by the government of India to undertake a detailed examination of the CRPC with a review to its general revision. So we were not talking about making amendments to the CRPC of 1898. We wanted to have a complete revision, a general revision so that we could excise out all those parts that were not applicable to the current society. The work was started immediately and has been going on since 1961 continuously. While this intensive study of the code was in progress, the commission found it necessary to consider a few specific problems arising out of 
certain provisions of the code and report separately thereon to the government. And then it talks about what are the kinds of changes that were suggested. Then it moves on to talk about changes section by section. So, the territorial content, application to schedule areas and so on. So, it talks about things section by section regarding the 1898 Act. And on the basis of this particular recommendation, we had the new CRPC that was made. So, the CRPC of 1973 is a central act. It was passed by the Indian Parliament. It is a procedural law. It establishes procedure for the administration of justice and actualization of substantive law. What do we mean by actualization of substantive law? If you have made a substantive law that defines offenses and prescribes penalties for doing those offenses, then how are those penalties going to be given? Is determined by the procedural law. So, it helps in the actualization of the substantive law. It helps in the application of the substantive law, the actual administration of the substantive law. In courts, through complaints, FIR, investigation, inquiry, trials. So, the CRPC talks about all of these things. Complaints, FIR, investigation by police officers, inquiry by magistrates or the court, trials. So, trials begin after the inquiry ends. Then, setting up of the machinery. How will the courts be arranged? Which court reports to whom? What will happen if a case comes to a court that it does not have territorial jurisdiction upon? So, all of these things are discussed in the CRPC. They are defined, they are um, talked about in the CRPC. To ensure fair trial. So, why do we want to have this procedure? Because we want to have a fair trial of the accused people. We need to have speedy justice. So, we'll find that throughout the CRPC, it makes provisions for justice to be done in the shortest possible time. So, it makes for a flow chart or an algorithm that is the shortest one and rights following the principles of natural justice. You will find that the principles of natural justice are being followed everywhere. So, everywhere you will find that the judges can recuse themselves and um, everybody has the right of hearing. The CRPC is divided into 39 chapters, 1 to 37 and then there are two additional chapters 7a and 21a and all of these chapters are divided into sections. Then we have the first schedule which is the classification of offenses, second schedule which deals with forms, first appendix that talks about extracts from the Code of Criminal Procedure Amendment Act 2005 and the last section is 484 repeal and savings which says the Code of Criminal Procedure 1898 is hereby repealed. So, this is what the Law Commission report was talking about making a general revision of the CRPC 1898 and by making of the CRPC 1973 the CRPC of 1898 was repealed. So, let us now have a look at the CRPC of 1973. This is how it stands. The Code of Criminal Procedure 1973, arrangement of sections. The preliminary sections are short title, extent and commencement. And we have found that these are the, uh, the common section that is found in most of the acts. Section 2, definitions. This again is very common. Then construction of references trial of offences under the IPC and other laws and saving of provisions. Then chapter 2 deals with constitution of criminal courts and offices. So, how are the criminal courts made? How are the offices related to them made? So, it talks about classes of criminal courts, territorial divisions, metropolitan areas, court of session, subordination of assistant sessions judges, Courts of Judicial Magistrate, CJM and Additional CJM, Special Judicial Magistrate, Local Jurisdiction of Judicial Magistrate, Subordination of Judicial Magistrate. So, basically what we are talking about here is that it is defining different 
codes and it is also establishing the hierarchy of those. Then we have executive magistrates that are not judicial magistrates. So people like the DM or the SDM they are or the Tehsildar they are the executive magistrates of an area. Then it talks about special executive magistrates, local jurisdiction of those, subordination of executive magistrates. Then it defines who is going to be a public prosecutor. Now in a criminal proceeding, the government's side or the society's side is put up by the public prosecutor and the other side is known as the defense. So it talks about public prosecutor, assistant public prosecutor and directorate of prosecution. So this is what the hierarchy of the judicial magistrate uh, machinery is going to be. Then chapter 3 talks about power of courts. So if the courts have to perform their duties, they need to be given certain powers. So courts by which offenses are triable, jurisdiction in the case of juveniles, sentences which high courts and sessions judges may pass, sentences which magistrates may pass. So it is defining who has the power to do what. Sentence of imprisonment in default of fine, sentences in cases of conviction of several offenses at one trial, mode of conferring powers, powers of officers appointed, withdrawal of powers and powers of judges and magistrates exercisable by their successors in office. So everything about the powers of the courts. Then chapter 4 deals with powers of the police. So powers of superior officers of police, aid to the magistrates and the police public meant to assist magistrates and police, aid to person other than police officer executing a warrant, public to give information of certain offences, duty of officers employed in connection with the affairs of a village to make certain report. So it is now talking about the powers of the police and it is also giving duty to the public that they need to aid the police officer, they need to give information to the police officer because other, otherwise the police officers will not be able to perform their duties, they require assistance. Then chapter 5 deals with arrest of persons, how are you going to make an arrest? When police may arrest without warrant, so it is talking about cognizable offences where there can be an arrest without warrant. Notice of appearance before police officer procedure of arrest and duties of officer making arrest. So it's not that the police only has powers, the police also has duties. So it talks about the duties of the officer that is making arrest. Then control room at districts, right of arrested person to meet an advocate of his choice during interrogation. Now we saw before that the CRPC is trying to provide for natural justice in all the proceedings. So if a person has been arrested, then he has the right to meet an advocate of his choice during interrogation so that he gets uh, legal uh, information and uh, legal advice. Then arrest on refusal to give name and residence, arrest by private person and procedure on such arrest. So arrest cannot just be done by the police, arrest can also be done by private people, arrest can also be done by the magistrate. And these are being explained in the CRPC. Protection of members of the armed forces from arrest. Then it talks about how is an arrest made. Search of place entered by person sought to be arrested. So if a person who is to be arrested, he enters into some place, then the police has the powers to search that place. And during that search, they have the power to break open the doors or windows to get inside. So it talks about all of those things. Pursuit of offenders into other jurisdictions. So if the offender has moved out of your district or out of the state boundaries, then can you pursue them or not? No unnecessary restraint. Person arrested to be informed of grounds of arrest and of the right to bail. So if a person is being arrested, he needs to be informed why is he being arrested and whether or not he has the right to bail. Now in our country, the Offences are divided into bailable and non-bailable offences. In the case of bailable offences, there is a right to bail. 
So bail is available as a matter of right. In the case of non-bailable offences, also you can get a bail, but that will be given by the police or by the court. So this has to be informed to that person because he might not know about these things. Obligation of person making arrest to inform a, about the arrest etc. to a nominated person. So his friends and family, they also need to be informed. Search of the arrested person. Power to seize offensive weapons. So if there are offensive weapons with the person, then those will be seized. Examination of accused by medical practitioner at the request of the police officer to gather certain evidence. Examination of person accused of rape by medical practitioner. Examination of arrested person by medical officer. So how is the medical officer going to do the examination? Identification of person arrested. Procedure where when police officer deputes subordinate to arrest without warrant. So if a superior officer deputes his subordinate to arrest without warrant, then what is going to be the procedure there? What is the procedure that the subordinate is going to perform and so on. Now health and safety of the arrested person. Person arrested to be taken before magistrate or officer in charge of police station. Person arrested not to be detained for more than 24 hours. Discharge of person apprehended, power on escape to pursue and retake. So if somebody escapes from a lawful custody, then the police has the power to pursue and retake that person into its custody using force if required. Then arrest to be made strictly according to the code. So you cannot make an arrest without following these provisions. Then chapter 6 talks about processes to compel appearance. So if there is a trial going on and if the court wants to call somebody, then it can issue summons or it can issue warrants. So it talks about the these processes. Form of summons. Summons how served. So how will a summons be made? How will a summons be served on the person? Service of summons on corporate bodies and societies. Service when persons summoned cannot be found. Procedure when service cannot be effected as before provided. Service on government servant. Service of summons outside local limits. Proof of service in, case, in such cases and when serving officer is not present. And service of summons on witness by post. So basically when the court has made these summons, then they need to be served on that person. Now, if that person is available within the jurisdiction or the advocate is available for that person, then the summons can be served on them. Or if the person is not available, then the summons may be served on a family member, but not to a servant. If the person is not available, then there can be a notification made in the surroundings by say beating of drums. Or there can be a substituted uh, service. So you can have uh, the summons printed out and it can be stuck to either the locality or on the courthouse and so on. Or in certain cases, the summons can also be sent by post. So it talks about all of these different categories of summons, how they are made, how they are served and what is the procedure to be followed. Then it talks about warrant of arrest. So, in the case of non-cognizable offences, you require arrest warrants. Police cannot arrest without a warrant in the case of non-cognizable offences. Now, it, it is talking about form of warrant of arrest and duration. So, even if the court wants to compel the appearance of somebody and the person is not responding to the summons, then the court can also issue an arrest warrant. And in that case, the police will go and bring that person. Power to direct security to be taken. Warrants to whom directed. Warrant may be direct to 
directed to any person warrant directed to a police officer notification of substance of warrant person arrested to be brought before court without delay where warrant may be executed at what place warrant forwarded for execution outside jurisdiction warrant directed to police officer for execution outside jurisdiction procedure on arrest of person against whom warrant issued procedure by magistrate before whom such person arrested is brought so if a person is arrested outside the territorial jurisdiction then what the police will do is bring that person to the nearest magistrate so what will that magistrate do is also defined in this particular section then it talks about proclamation and attachment so if a person is absconding then a proclamation may be issued for that person his property may be attached so in that case the property is attached so that the person has to come back claims and objections to attachment so the person also has the option of making an objection to the attachment because here again everybody has a right to put up their case release sale and restoration of attached property appeal from order rejecting application for restoration of attached property and then other rules regarding processes issue of warrant in lieu of or in addition to summons power to take bond for appearance so in the case of a bond there is a document that is signed with or without sureties that i agree to come at this uh, at, at, when, uh, at whichever time and place i am asked to come arrest on breach of bond for appearance so if a person has signed the bond for appearance and then does a breach of bond meaning that he does not appear before the court so that person may be arrested under this section then provisions of this chapter generally applicable to summonses and warrants of arrest then the next chapter deals with processes to compel the production of things so far we were talking about compelling the production of persons or the appearance of persons now the next chapter talks about production of things now here as well we, you have summons to produce summons to produce document or other thing so if a relevant document or other thing is with a person then a summons may be issued to that person to produce that document or other thing before the court procedure as to letters and telegrams so in the case of letters and telegrams the court or the magistrate can write to the authorities to bring those letters and telegrams to the court then it talks about search warrants when search warrants may be issued under what circumstances search of place suspected to contain stolen property forged documents etc power to declare certain publications forfeited and to issue search warrants for the same so if there are certain publications including newspapers or books or documents that have been forfeited under the sections of the ipc which means that they have been made government property they can now no longer be circulated so if certain publications have been forfeited then search warrants may be issued for the same so the police can enter into any property that is that they have a reasonable suspicion that these publications are kept there and then they can search that property and confiscate those materials so the search for those is done under section 95 application to high court to set aside declaration of forfeiture so there can be an application made to the high court because again people have the right to put up their cases search for persons wrongfully confined so if somebody has wrongfully confined a person meaning that they have kept that person locked in a room or somewhere then there can be a search made for those persons who are believed to be wrongfully confined power to compel restoration of abducted females so if females have been abducted then they will be restored back under this section and force may be used for that as well then general provisions relating to searches direction etc of search warrants person in charge of closed place to allow search 
we saw before that it also imposes duty on pu the public so the person who is in charge of a closed place has to allow the search and aid in the search disposal of things found in search beyond jurisdiction then the miscellaneous provisions power of police officer to seize certain property magistrate may direct search in his presence power to impound document etc that has been produced and reciprocal arrangements regarding the processes then chapter 7a from the name itself we can see that it was added later on so this is an addition so it talks about reciprocal arrangements for assistance in certain matters and procedure for attachment and forfeiture of property definitions assistance in securing transfer of persons assistance in relation to orders of attachment or forfeiture of property identifying unlawfully acquired property seizure or attachment of property management of property seized or forfeited under this chapter notice of forfeiture forfeiture in certain cases fine in lieu of forfeiture certain transfers to be null and void procedure in respect of letter of request and application of the chapter so because this uh, this chapter was added later on so you will find that all of these sections also have the numbers that are followed by an alphabet so because the last section was 105 so now it begins with 105 a b c d and so on then chapter 8 deals with security for keeping the peace and for good behavior security for keeping the peace on conviction security for keeping the peace in other cases security for good behavior from persons disseminating seditious matters so a security may be asked from the person who have been disseminating seditious matters and they have to follow good behavior if not then that security gets forfeited security for good behavior from suspected persons security for good behavior from habitual offenders order to be paid procedure in respect of person present in court summons or warrant and so on order to give security contents of bond power to reject securities so it talks about all of these things then chapter 9 deals with order for maintenance of wives children and parents how will these orders be made what is the procedure if the order has been made can an, uh, can an alteration or change in the allowance be made how will that alteration be made and enforcement of the order of maintenance then chapter 10 deals with maintenance of public order and tranquility unlawful assemblies so if there is an unlawful assembly then it can be disseminate dispersal by the use of force by the use of civil force then you can also make use of armed forces to disperse this unlawful assembly so first of all civil force will be used and then the armed forces will also be utilized power of certain armed force officers to disperse assembly protection against prosecution for acts done under the preceding sections so because this is a big assembly or a big mob so it has to be dispersed either by using civil force or by using armed forces and when uh, the civil force or the armed forces are using force so there can be prosecution and so this section is providing for protection against such prosecution so if they are doing acts under the preceding sections then they also have these safeguards available to them then it talks about public nuisances conditional order for removal of nuisance service or notification of order person to whom the order is addressed to obey or show cause consequences of his failing to do so procedure where existence of public right is denied procedure where he appears to show cause so basically if there is a public nuisance then how are the authorities going to treat that public nuisance they are going to give an order the person is asked to show cause or remove that nuisance and so on then it talks about urgent cases of nuisance or, or apprehended danger here comes section 144 so this is one of the most discussed and debated sections of the crpc 144 
सो इट गिवस द पावर टू इशू ऑर्डर इन अर्जेंट केसेस ऑफ न्यूसेंस और अप्रीहेंडेड डेंजर देन वन फोर्टी फोर ए प्रोवाइड पावर टू प्रोहेबिट कैरिंग आर्म्स इन प्रोसेशन और मास ड्रिल और मास ट्रेनिंग विथ आर्म्स देन इट टॉक्स अबाउट डिस्प्यूट एज टू इमूवेबल प्रॉपर्टी सो वट इज द प्रोसीजर दैट इज गोइंग टू बी फॉलोड देर देन चैप्टर इलेवन डील्स विद द प्रिवेंटिव एक्शन ऑफ द पुलिस पुलिस टू प्रिवेंट कॉग्निजेबल ऑफेंसेज सो दे डू नॉट जस्ट हैव टू इन्वेस्टिगेट द ऑफेंसेज एंड ब्रिंग पीपल टू द कोर्ट बट दे ऑल्सो हैव द पावर टू प्रिवेंट द कॉग्निजेबल ऑफेंसेज इन्फॉर्मेशन ऑफ डिजाइन टू कमिट कॉग्निजेबल ऑफेंसेज arrest to prevent the commission of cognizable offences so even if the person has not done a cognizable offence he he or she can be arrested to prevent the commission of cognizable offences prevention of injury to public property and inspection of weights and measures in which case the police also has the power to enter into any premises and if there are counterfeit weights and measures and instruments then those can be seized then chapter 12 talks about information to the police and their powers to investigate how is information given and how are police going to investigate on the basis of that information so information in cognizable cases information as to non cognizable cases and investigation of such cases police officers power to investigate a cognizable case then what will be the procedure for investigation how will the police do the investigation how will they make a report how will they submit the report how will they hold investigation or preliminary inquiry how will they require the attendance of witnesses because if they do not have this power then no witness will be uh, uh, may be willing to uh, give his or her statement so they have the power to require the attendance of witnesses they can examine the witnesses then it says the statements are not to be signed uses of statements in evidence so uh, we'll also discuss this under the indian evidence act that the statement given to the police officer is not an acceptable evidence in the court then no inducement to be offered recording of confession and statements now 164 again is a very important section because it provides for recording of confession and statements by the magistrate then medical examination of the victim of rape search by a police officer when officer in charge of a police station may require another to issue a search warrant so the officer in charge has gone to some other place and is requiring the officer in charge of that police station to issue a search warrant letter of request to competent authority for investigation in a country or place outside india and so on so this talks about all of these matters then chapter 13 talks about jurisdiction of criminal courts in inquiries and trials so when the courts are doing inquiries and trials what is going to be the procedure for that what is going to be their jurisdiction for that so it talks about ordinary place of inquiry and trial where will the inquiry and trial be held place of inquiry or trial offence triable when act is done or consequence ensues place of trial where an act or is an offence by relation by reason of relation to other offence place of trial in certain other offences offences committed by letters offences offences committed on a journey or a voyage so for all of these different cases what is going to be the place of jurisdiction what is going to be the place of inquiry and trial because if there is an an offence that has been committed on a journey or a voyage so in that case is the starting place of the journey the place of inquiry and trial is the ending place uh, the right place or is the place where the offence happened and so on so all of these things should be discussed because there should not be any doubt regarding which court has has the competence of uh, doing the trial and so this chapter deals with all of these matters then chapter 14 deals with conditions requisite for initiation of proceedings so how will the the proceedings in the court begin how will the magistrate take cognizance of the offences transfer on application of the accused 
So the accused can also make an application that I am not comfortable with this magistrate. Please send my case to another magistrate. That can also happen because here again, you always need to maintain the clause of fairness. There shouldn't be an unbiasedness uh, in the whole of the proceedings. So if the accused says that, okay, this magistrate is in relation to me or this magistrate is an enemy of me or this magistrate has already taken actions against me and so uh, I need my application to be, uh, my uh, case to be dealt with by another magistrate, he can make that application and this section is providing for those applications. Then making over of cases to magistrates, cognizance of offenses by courts of session, additional and assistant sessions judge. Uh, to try cases made over to them and so on. So, how will the proceedings initiate? So, in the beginning of the proceedings, what are the conditions is what this chapter is dealing with. Then chapter 15 deals with complaints to magistrates and examination of complaint. So, in a large number of cases, we make complaints to magistrate. So, you have two ways of approaching the court. One is through the police. So, the police after making their investigation, they will send their report to the magistrate or a person can also make a complaint or an authority can also make a complaint. So, basically when we talk about the conservation laws like the Indian Forest Act or the Wildlife Protection Act. So, those cases are brought to the court either by the forest officers or by the police officers. So, if the cases are brought to the court by the police officers, then they will make use of those sections where the police is uh, required to submit their report. But when the forest officers are dealing with those cases, then they will bring those offenses for trial to the court using this section, section 200. So they will make a complaint case, such cases are known as complaint cases and then those cases are examined by the magistrate and then the rest of the process starts procedure by magistrate not competent to take cognizance of the case. So, in that case, he may return that complaint to back to the complainant or he may send that uh, complaint to the other magistrate. He may endorse that complaint. Then there is postponement of issue of process, dismissal of the complaint. So, this is regarding how the things will start. Then chapter 16 deals with commencement of proceedings. How will proceedings start? issue of process, magistrate may dispense with personal attendance of the accused. So, if a person has been accused of an offence, he does not need to be present in the court at all times. The magistrate may dispense with the personal attendance or if the magistrate has dispensed with the personal attendance, he may also insist that in the next hearing or from the next hearing onwards, the accused has to be present personally. So, these are all the powers given to the magistrates. Special summons in the cases of petty offence. So, if there is a very small offence that can be summarily tried, then there is the provision of giving a special summons. So, the processes are very fast in these cases. Supply to the accused of copy of police report and other documents. So, the accused needs to make his case and for that he requires a copy of police report and all the other documents that will be used in this case. So, they have to be supplied to the accused free of charge. Supply of copies of statements of witnesses and documents to the accused in other cases triable by court of session. Commitment of case to court of session when offences triable exclusively by it. So, the, so the CRPC divides offences again into offences that are triable exclusively by a court of session and offences that are not tribal exclusively by the court of session, meaning that in the first set of offences, which are typically graver offences, only a sessions court can take the cognizance and uh, do the trial, whereas in the other cases, any court can do the trial. Now, procedure to be followed when there is a complaint case and police investigation in respect of the same offence. So, if you have both a complaint case and a police case, then what will the court do. Then chapter 17 deals with the charge. What is to be written in the charge? Particulars as to the time, place and person, 
manner of committing offense whether it should be stated or not then it talks about joinder of charges can you have a joining of charges of different offenses then chapter 18 deals with trial before a court of session so what will happen in a court of session so the trial starts with the public prosecutor he makes an opening case if the case is not sufficient then the accused may be discharged then there is the framing of the charge conviction on the plea of guilty so if the accused says that he is guilty then he can directly be convicted if not then there is a date for prosecution evidence evidence for prosecution and then again there is the option of acquittal of that person then the defense comes in and once both the parties have presented their cases then there is the uh, the uh, section for arguments so both the parties will put up their arguments re relating to, to the case and the evidences that they have and the other party has presented then again there is judgment of acquittal or conviction after this judgment is made if a person is convicted then there is discussion regarding his previous conviction because that may lead to an enhanced amount of sentencing so all of these things are discussed in chapter 18 then chapter 19 deals with trial of warrant cases by magistrates so the crpc divides cases into summons cases and warrant cases now here we are talking about the warrant cases cases instituted on a police report then cases instituted otherwise than on police report conclusion of trial then it talks about trial of summons cases by magistrates what is the procedure that they are going to follow there then chapter 21 deals with summary trials so there is the power to try summarily the smaller offenses petty offenses then what is the procedure for those summary trials how will the records be made how is the judgment given what is the language of record and judgment all of these things are dealt with in this particular chapter so throughout you will find that there is a logical arrangement of these sections into different chapters then chapter 21a talks about plea bargaining so plea bargaining as you can see from the title of uh, from the uh, number of the chapter this whole chapter was added later on so even in india we have the option of plea bargaining and this chapter deals with how that plea bargaining is going to be done then chapter 22 deals with attendance of persons confined or detained in prisons so if a person is confined or detained in a prison then how will that person be called to the court so all the procedures relating to that then 23 deals with evidence in inquiries and trials what is the mode of taking and recording evidence in the court what is the language to be used in the court evidence to be taken in the presence of the accused because he should not be able to say later on that this was this evidence was taken in my absence and so i do not know and probably it's a biased evidence record in summons cases and inquiries record in warrant cases record in trial so all different modalities are discussed in all of these different sections then commissions for the examination of witnesses then chapter 24 deals with general provisions as to inquiries and trials so what are the general provisions when these inquiries or trials are going on and then chapter 25 deals with provisions as to the accused persons of unsound mind so if the accused person is of an unsound mind then what is the procedure what are the provisions for that case procedure in case of accused being a lunatic procedure in case of a person of unsound mind tried before court release of person of, un of unsound mind pending investigation on trial resumption of inquiry or trial so all of these things are dealt with in chapter 25 then 26 deals with provisions as to offenses affecting the administration of justice so how will those offenses be dealt then chapter 27 talks about the judgment so when the court gives a judgment then what is a judgment what is the language and contents of the judgment and how will different magistrates and courts make their judgments then chapter 28 deals with submission of death sentences for confirmation 
so if a court of session has given a death sentence then it has to be given to the high court for confirmation and this chapter deals with how will that submission be made what is the procedure then chapter 29 deals with appeals so if there is a judgment it can be appealed on to a superior court so how will those appeals be done then we have reference and revision of the judgments we have transfer of criminal cases we have execution remi suspension remission and commutation of sentences so the sentences may be executed or they may be suspended for some time being or they may be uh, there may be a remission that is their quantum can be reduced or there can be a commutation of the sentences so it talks about all of those then we have chapter 33 that deals with provision as to bails and bonds so when is a bail given how is a bail given what is a bond how is a bond made how is a bond dispensed with and so on then we have a chapter on disposal of property how is property disposed and in this case you have this uh, important section power to sell perishable property so if a property has been seized by an authority and that property is a perishable property it won't stand for a very long period of time then the court has the power to sell that perishable property and that money can be uh, used just as the perishable property would have been uh, dispensed with in the case so if the perish if the accused is acquitted and the property should have gone back to the accused so in place of the perishable property that money will go back to the accused and if the accused is convicted and this property should have been made a property of the government it would have been confiscated then this money will move to the government and then chapter 35 deals with irregular proceedings then we have limitation for taking cognizance of certain offenses what is the time period and then we have the miscellaneous provisions then you have the first schedule that deals with classification of offenses and we are going to discuss this in great detail in the next lecture and the second schedule that deals with forms so when we talk about all of these procedures then what is the manner in which recordings have to be done if you have to send a summons to an accused person what is the format of that summons if a warrant is to be sent what is the format of a warrant and so on so it, it prescribes all of these different forms and then you have the first appendix now we'll just look at a few other important things when we look at the short title extent and commencement then it says the it extends to the whole of india provided that the provisions of this code other than those relating to chapters 8 10 and 11 shall not apply to the state of nagaland and to the tribal areas so while this act extends to the whole of india there are certain provisions that are not applicable to nagaland and to tribal areas and what are these tribal areas it means the territories which immediately before the 21st day of january 1972 were included in the tribal areas of assam as referred to in paragraph 20 of the sixth schedule of the constitution other than those within the local limits of the municipality of shillong so those sections are will uh, will not apply to these two areas and it comes into force on the first day of april 1974 and then uh, if you look at the second section definitions then it defines all of these different things what is a bailable offense what is a charge what is a cognizable of offense what is a complaint what is a high court and all of these different things so we have seen in a large number of uh, different cases as well that section 2 deals with the definitions and here also all the things are defined in very great detail so in short the crpc is a very important procedural act it has a long history dating back to 1861 and the new act of 1973 it was made on the recommendations of the law commission and it has thoroughly revised and repealed the previous crpc of 1898 so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind